Yo, what's good everybody? It's me, your boy Agostino. Welcome back to another episode of the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 85. How the bloody hell are you all doing? Hope you're good. Hope you're chilled. Hope you're well rested. As you can tell, I am perspiring. Like every inch of my body is, um, you know, covered with some sort of liquidy, sweaty substance. And um, unfortunately for you guys who are watching via YouTube, you're going to have to look at that. And unfortunately for you guys listening via your uh, favorite podcast app, you're going to have to hear me panting (sighs) whilst I try and recover my composure. But I hope after all those little weird things happen and it kind of levels itself out, you can say after the podcast finished, that was a great time. (laughs) <laughs> no, nah, but seriously, I hope you guys are well. I hope you guys are good. Um, episode number 85 of the Exxon Zinger Show. It's what? Monday morning. Um, here I am in the depths of Stratford, specifically Maryland, right? Recording this podcast before I drop to work. So I thought I'd say hi and just good morning. Um, I've just got back from a run, which might explain the fact that I'm sweating like an absolute pig. But a lot of it has to do with the weather outside. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that I like to wear black. Um... Again, not sure what it is about the black thing. I'm not sure what it is. What, I'm not sure if it's a goth in me. I'm not sure if it's the emo with me. I'm not sure if it's the fact that, you know, black is the most flattering color for any, any one of all shapes and sizes. But regardless, I probably need to start wearing other colors apart from black to start attracting the sun to the pores of my skin, which will then result in a reduction in sweat. Um, apart from that, yeah, I've just got back from a run. I went on a little 5K run this morning. I felt really good, really fresh. I think all those little interval runs I've been doing, those little training sessions I've been doing have been really, 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 really beneficial. I feel like I've got um, the adequate amount of fitness or the adequate, no, the adequate amount of cardio endurance for me to go quicker. But the only thing I need to do is lose a bit of weight in order to kind of like move faster as I'm running, right? Um, that's kind of what I realized. I've kind of hit a bit of a brick wall in terms of how fast I can go weighing the way that way weighing the way that I weighing the weight that I am now. Um, so the next step is to kind of lose a couple lbs, and then I'll be able to really push it and go the extra extra mile. Oh, and talking about losing lbs or pounds as they call it, lbs. Look what I done over the weekend, eh? So if you if you listen to, if you listen to this then bear with me but um, I'm showing the camera my little goals to do list that I've made for now and to the end of August. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned I mentioned I forgot what episode I mentioned it in but I mentioned um, the idea of setting little small micro goals um, that you can achieve, that that will kind of push you but are achievable in that respect extent right. So the idea behind it is to kind of um, rewire your brain's reward system to know that like even though sometimes people can say the end of august might be a long time away the fact that you can hit out you can find that you can list you can make a list of 10 goals you might not achieve all of them you might maybe do only six but that rewiring of your brain reward system to know that hey you can put you can um you can go without certain things you can have like a delayed gratification thing right so you can rewire your brain in order to kind of understand that delayed gratification is not as hard as you make it seem so the end of august seems like a long way away but really when you think about it really it's not that much of a long way away so the idea behind it is to kind of have these small micro goals that you can kind of hit but also a little bit outside of your reach so that when it comes to the end of august you can then recalibrate and then set more goals along the way because sometimes i feel like when you spec out goals for the entire year especially goals maybe an overall goal for the year is a good idea right um maybe an overall goal of being more mindful or an overall goal of um, going for it, or, or, or not taking chances, an overall goal of um, saying that you want to earn a particular amount within the, within that year, you want to make sure that you earn a particular amount outside of your work, that might be a good overall goal, but to have a list of goals for the entire year, I think, is setting yourself up for failure, um, because the moment you... The moment you don't achieve one or two by February or March, you're just going to chuck away the rest, in it? It's sort of like when you have a diet, then you cheat one day or you cheat during one meal, you just feel like throwing away the whole day and starting again the next day, right? Which isn't really the best way to go about doing things. So micro goals, in my experience, work really well. If you wanted to, you could probably break this down even more and say, I'm doing the end of August. I'm basically doing a month and a half, right? Or a month and two weeks. But you could even break it down even further and just say a two-week goal list, right? Uh, I want to do this for two weeks or whatever. That, that could be a good way to go about things. But um, this is what I'm doing for myself. 
So if you're if you're listening and you can't see this, um, the goals that I'm kind of I'm aiming to do for until the end of August is to lose twenty pounds. So I weigh a total of two hundred pound by the end of August, which is probably a bit of a stretch, but I want to put it down there. You know, I'm I'm pretty sure it, it probably might take a bit longer to lose that kind of amount of weight, but considering I'm working out five to six times a day for forty five minutes a day, and considering that I'm fasting five days a week for 16 hours i should be able to achieve it but you know you never know but i'm just from putting up a stretch goal um i've also got here write and publish one blog entry per day in the style of a seth godin like to write on my blog like an, an opinion piece or something i'm thinking about uh read two hours per day that i'm again i'm, I'm upping it because i usually do one hour of reading per day um but sometimes I, I i slack on the weekends so i don't really pick it up on the weekends but i'm aiming to do two hours a day now um and including the weekends too um, which will be a lot easier now because I've done this, a little hack for reading, by the way, if you want to increase your reading time. I've made a little hack where I always keep a, the book that I'm currently reading to, on the side of my bed. So in the morning when I get up, and you know when you're in the morning, you get up and you quickly check your phone and check your social media feed. I just grab my book and read a couple pages. Um, and that can count towards the two hours time that I want to include in my reading time. Do you know what I mean? And then include the time that I'm going traveling to work which isn't that long really because my work isn't too far. It's about 20 minute journey, but still it's a little bit of reading there, 20 minutes there, 20 minutes back. And then plus the hour lunch break that I have, which I usually spend most of that time reading anyway. So you can easily add up across the day, but even if you're not working, you can, you can easily spec out like 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon and kind of like split out um, throughout the day. Cause sometimes a lot of people find reading a bit boring. Um, I've also got here, learn Spanish one hour per day, which will be, fairly easy to do with this book here teachers of spanish just going through that book basically an hour um i did this before i went to barcelona for the first time in 2013-14 and i found it really really beneficial so um i definitely think this will be something that i could be doing a lot easier plus the brunette's uh, brother will be visiting sometime towards the end of august so i would like to have a little bit of a grasp of spanish to be able to communicate with him a little bit so i've got a bit of a goal there in terms of like how much spanish i want to learn i want to be at least you know at least have a bit of conversational spanish on my in my uh, repertoire because at the moment I've, I've only got like hello how are you how's your day how's your night um i i ate a sandwich that elephant is big you know what i mean <laughs> um then i've got of course fast for 16 hours per day i'm starting to friday i just written that down because sometimes writing down even though i do it anyway right i'm doing fast i'm fasting anyway using the app called zero um definitely check it out it's an ios an app by uh, this guy called kevin rose who used to be the founder of dig um and does a random show a, a podcast with tim ferris so i don't forget me check that out um and so the app's called zero and you can track your fasting there i fast anyway but it's good to always track stuff so it's good no, it's good to always write things down to kind of um What's that thing called? Reaffirm what you're doing, right? To kind of put it in your mind that, yeah, this is what I'm doing. Then I've got a vlog. I've got publish a vlog or upload one YouTube video per day. It's going to be a bit more difficult than all the other ones because this is a new habit that I'm going to have to introduce into my workflow or into my um, output. I don't usually write, I don't usually make vlogs that daily anymore. I remember I did it before a few, a couple of years ago. Um, and I felt, it felt really good. Like you could tell the difference of quality between the first and the, f and the six. The first one started out looking like a fake Casey Neistat. And by the end of it, I kind of had my own little style going on. And most of it, I was just filming it on my phone, which is, you know, the easiest barrier to entry. And YouTube is just using your iPhone because iPhone is fucking amazing in terms of um, what it can do in terms of a vlogging camera. So that that's going to be a bit more difficult to do, but I've already got the tools on me. I've got iMovie already downloaded my phone. I've got 128 gigabyte iPhone, so I can already make, uh, little YouTube videos on my phone on the go, so that shouldn't be too difficult. But I'm I'm, I'm a bit dubious on that one. We've not achieved it, but I'm going to try my best to do so. And then um, the lastly, I've got podcast three episodes per week. Now this is again ramping it up from what I usually do, right? But I've set the precedent today because I, I don't usually record on Mondays. I usually record on Wednesday. For, I usually record on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, right? But I'm, I'm going to record on Monday so that I can record again on Wednesday and I record again on Thursday. Uh, because those are the days I usually have free that can kind of record my podcast and no one's around and stuff. And plus when the brunette's um, brother comes around as well, I won't have time to kind of record podcasts and shit or whatever. So I kind of have to kind of batch things in together. But this should be a little bit more, a bit of a stretch as well because I usually do two. So I'm adding one extra on there again. So as, as I mentioned before, 
I'm just I'm, I've kind of got goals on here that are a little bit um, far away from me like the losing 20 pounds uh, by the end of August is probably a bit of a stretch but it's something to aim for and then I've got things that within my warehouse such as reading for two hours such as learning Spanish for one hour per day faster six hours a day but then things as well that I haven't done already uh, such as vlogging so this is going to be a bit of a stretch a bit of a challenge but I'm really eager to get it done and for me I'm setting goals and stuff but no uh, um I think it's important, man. So, I mean, second half of the year, um, it's July. We're heading into August slowly but surely. And you kind of just want to get yourself a situ situated in the right way. And plus, I think the end of August is bank holiday weekend as well and stuff, isn't it? So, I kind of want to give myself a bit a good platform. So, if I do end up going crazy and going out and having a bit of a good time, I've already built up a good set of habits that I can easily kind of, you know, jump back into once that bank holiday weekend's over. Because sometimes, you know, starting things just before bank holiday weekend, you kind of have, like I said before, when you do a diet and you've, and you cheat um or you don't or you don't eat the correct foods for one meal you just kind of throw the whole day out the window that can sometimes happen when you have a bank holiday weekend you know you can kind of think oh my god i want to go crazy and have a good time and then little by you know what i mean and then slowly but surely you wake up and you realize you're you know lying on the floor somewhere in a gutter somewhere around labbrook grove with no camera no wallet and no iphone um, not that it happened to me of course but you know just speaking <laughs> hypothetically there so here we are, episode number 85. Welcome and good evening or good morning, good afternoon, whatever it may be. So my weekend's been fairly um, action-packed, fairly action-packed or fairly stable, as you could call it, stable, action-packed. I didn't do that much this weekend, kind of kept my head down and was concentrating on making, writing down my goals. Um, I did. A f I made a couple brief little t-shirt idea things, which has been quite cool as well. Um, kind of getting back into the flow of making t-shirts and shit. That's been pretty interesting. And, um, I've also found loads of t-shirts that I, I designed on Photoshop that were part of little merch things, ideas that I did for this night called So Special that I used to put on back in the day uh, with, a, with a friend of mine in the Alibi. And the merch is from ages ago, of course, but I'm thinking of just making it anyway, you know, just making it and putting it out there. It's not, you know, it doesn't have any relevance now because you know, the night's over, but just for me personally, just as a kind of like, you know, ticking up the box, that could be an interesting thing to do to kind of put out there. Um, I've got some interesting, oops, sorry about that. I've got some interesting pieces actually in there that I've kind of should have, you know, you wish you should have made it during the time that, what I've actually dickhead, I should have just put it out during the time that I did it, but you know, sometimes in life you do, I don't know, you make mistakes and you kind of just take your ball off, you take your foot off the pedal a little bit. I don't know why I didn't put them out. Some really good pieces of merch, like pieces of merch that celebrated our first, third and fourth birthday that were pretty well done. And now, actually, because of all those missteps, I'm kind of now doing, I'm going to make some t-shirts for the little party that I do at the Heathcote, at the Heathcote and Star called uh, La Betis. So I'm going to do a few pieces for that. So that should be pretty fun. And um, just cause, because it's, it's, it's a monthly, it's, a, it's like a monthly, um, it's a monthly thing. So I thought, why not, you know, why not kind of just do a t-shirt that you can kind of wear when you're there and stuff. So it should be pretty pretty easy to do i think in all sense of the word so i'm looking forward to doing that sometime very soon not, not, not nothing super crazy just basically the fly design on the front and then um no sorry i'm, I'm gonna have a dj actually shall i get it up here let me just get it up here so you guys can see and if you're listening via the podcast then i apologize but i think it might be nice to kind of you know show off some stuff that i'm making at the moment um how am i gonna get this up here actually that's a good point isn't it Da, da, da. with my finder desktop bloody bloody blah Let's see if i can get it up here t-shirts cool so um see if i can get this up here i have to switch this bear with me one second guys display where's the display here we go Mm -mm -mm. let's see here let's see if i can get it in manual with two window let's see if it can if it can work here properly actually you gotta let me open the file first so um yeah it's been pretty fun doing it uh it reminds me of back in the day it's a bit it's a little bit, I feel a little bit paralysis by analysis. So you feel a little bit, it's a little bit of a cheat though. Not cheap. It feels a little bit fake, like fake work. 
designing t-shirts from Photoshop because you can do it all day, every day. But to go from a Photoshop file to a real life physical product is a whole different ball game. And that's where people kind of probably get stuck. That's why probably the, that's where the kind of, um, you hit a wall, right? Or the prices by analysis thing or the perfectionist thing kind of kicks in and you kind of feel like you haven't really honed the idea down or got it where it needs to be. That's just fucking stupid, really. Um, but yeah, I've got so many designs on my on, on my hard drive, on my on my a few other USB sticks that I'm randomly just flowing around. It's really bad, man. I should I really need to put these things out. Anyway, um, hopefully, I, let me try and get it up now. See if it works. To window. Let me see if I can get it up on the Photoshop thing. Hopefully, this works. And you guys can see this systems. Where is it? Ah, it's not here, is it? Nope. Finder, Chrome, Dropbox, Creative Cloud. What's that? Is that the one? Nope, it's not that. How do you get this up? There we go. Photoshop there. Found it. Okay, cool. So, um, hopefully this works. And you guys can see this. Dismiss. Okay, so we got it up on the screen now at the moment. Hopefully you guys can see this da, da, da. can you guys see this hopefully you can see it hopefully you can if not i guess i have to do it another way but here we go actually no well, let me take this off yeah let me just move it hide that now this is the worst. I apologize, but hey, what can you do? Anyway, I've been designing t-shirts. Um, you can't see at the moment because my uh, screen is being a bit of a B-I-T-C-H. But, you know, say la vie and all that malarkey. Uh, <clears throat> but in regards of that, for you, for all of you guys that are, are happen to be within the Stratford area, I'll be DJing again, actually, this Friday at the Tap East with my very, very good friend Aphrodite, which I'm looking forward to, for a night called Tapped, which they're, they're doing now recently. I made a little fly for it. I'm going to get this up on the screen. Hopefully you guys can see that. Show. There we go. So a night called Tapped at Tap East. It's going to be pretty fun, I think. I made this little fly the other day. What do you guys think of it? Looks pretty decent, doesn't it? Um, if you're wondering what the fire is, it's based on the One Step Flats fires that have been happening recently. Due to the extreme nature of the weather the other day, um, loads of fields have been burning. So I put the fire there. Might not be the best idea in the world, but hey, it's a flyer for me, for my own personal use. So anyway, uh, Tap East, uh, me and Aphrodite, Friday 27th of July from 5 to half 11. Come true and have a little dance with man. And talking about DJing and having fun, I actually DJed the other day at Heathcote and Star for a night called Labertees. We have a last minute.com affair uh, due to scheduling issues, but we got it sorted in the end. Really fun, great night. Um, probably the one of the top five times, top five best sets I've played there probably so far in my time playing in this uh, new bar in Leytonstone. And um, it kind of threw me off a bit, you know, because um, I guess because I came late. No, sorry, I didn't come late. I, I came on time, but because I found out I was playing late, I didn't have time to prepare a set beforehand, which kind of was a blessing, I think, in that respect, right? I turned up at the bar and I just brought, um, I kind of brought a, a USB stick up. I, I updated a couple of weeks ago, so it hasn't got any that much new stuff on it. And then I brought my controller just in case I kind of hit a bit of a brick wall. I set them both up, but then I ended up playing a predominantly my set from the USB stick, not from the actual controller, which was interesting. Um which goes to show that maybe I do enjoy having those limitations of only having a USB stick. Sometimes having a controller, I have access to my entire iTunes library, you know, 4,000 tunes. It's just, a, it gets a bit crazy sometimes. So anyway, I start, I ended up, I, I got in, I thought, you know what, fuck it, let me just go for the bangers. So I started, I, I came in pretty hard. And when I mean hard, I mean, I started off playing like R&B, um, pop, some disco stuff. But I started in playing like songs that I'd usually uh, reserve for later in the evening. I started playing that to begin with. And it got a really good response. And it kind of made me re, it, it kind of made me um, re question my entire approach when it comes to playing sets. Because I'm used to playing in really small bars and clubs and stuff for now, anyway, especially since I haven't been, um, since I pulled myself away from playing in Dawson and all those kind of um, hipster areas. 
it's allowed me to play longer sets, but I don't really play in front of a big, big audience as I used to before, right? Because in Dawson Shaw, that you kind of guaranteed to kind of get like a packed audience or a big. There's going to be a lot of people there, right? If you're playing in Dawson or Shoulders, just because, you know, it's Dawson or Shoulders. And there's always people around there that are going to be up for playing, um, up for like having a dance, having a boogie. But usually, because of, because of, with the big set, you, with the big groups of people, um, it's usually a lot harder to get sets there. Or if you are going to play sets there, usually only going to play a couple of hours or an hour um, max, right? So you don't necessarily get the chance to build, um, to kind of hone your skills as a DJ playing longer sets, which I have got the benefits of doing. So I don't play in front of a bigger crowd, but I get to play longer and it allows me to kind of play, it allows me to get better at playing sets that are over two hours, right? So I have to slowly um, progress into a set or slowly build up a particular sound or slowly curate um, the room, you know, kind of like um, get people on the dance floor, then clear the dance floor, then get them on again. Like it's like a constant sort of like a uh, dance I'm doing right now because of that, I have also kind of developed a bad habit of not knowing when to kind of take it up a notch. Right. Because I've because I remember when I used to, when I used to do nights in Dawson or in Shoreditch or whatever it may be, because I used to usually pro I used to usually promote them with friends or, or do, to promote them on my own it require me to start playing early, right? The kind of like the graveyard shift, quote unquote, right? Which will mean playing from like nine onwards. But usually from like nine to 11, nine to 10, I won't, I'll be playing my own play music to, to pleasure myself. And then from 11, when people start coming in, um, also from 10 to 11, when people start coming in, because I'd have to hand over to the DJ who was playing before, who's going to be playing after me, I'd kind of crank it up. But I got really good, even when I got invited uh, sometimes to play at other parties because I had like a bit of a name in Dawson during that time. I don't have a name at all now. I'm a fucking no one. But that time when I had some sort of reputation there, I would be invited to play an hour or an hour and a half set, right? And I was a fucking really good at coming in and just like hitting the ground running. And I think a lot of guys or girls that play in Dawson or playing that kind of scene can attest to this, right? You're fucking the master at playing that 55 to 59 minute set, right? You can smash it out like bang, 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 bang. But I've always idolized, I've always kind of looked up to the Berlin DJ, the kind of German techno um, house um the kind of like New York, um, Mankiso, Studio 54, Larry Hurd, uh, DJ Harvey idea of DJing, right? Where you are kind of like taking people on a journey throughout the night. Or even kind of the, what the guys do at Horse Meat, Horse, Horse, Meat, Horse Meat Disco. I've always looked up to those kind of people, right? And that requires you to kind of gain the skill of being able to play more than two hours. But there's also a fine line between knowing how to play for two hours plus and also knowing how to crank it up. And I feel like, yes, uh, the, the, the time I, if I feel like the set I played on Friday was probably the best version of myself of being able to kind of progress and crank it. I've, I did really well to kind of get people to stay in the bar because it's a real challenge, right? Because this pub I play in the Heathcote and Star, um, they have an amazing beer garden. It's probably one of the best beer gardens in this, in my little area, right? It's fucking huge. It's really nice. Um, Lo there's no canopies mostly you get loads of natural sunlight coming through just a fucking amazing beer garden so people end up just staying there but then it closes at around nine i think nine or ten right they close the beer garden and people start coming back into the bar but usually they come back into the bar just to go home and the challenge is to hold them in in the bar when they're coming through because like you know if the music is good you can kind of tweak people's interest especially if there's a group it's a group of people there's going to be one or two people in there that don't mind staying out but if the music is shit they're just going to walk out right or if this music isn't to their liking so if you so i realize if i start hot i can just i between the between the hours of nine to ten when they're kind of coming um back into the bar i can kind of grab their attention and hopefully they can then say oh this guy's okay and they can trust me with their night and then from like 10 to 11 i can kind of take it on my own little weird journey like i did and then kind of like go back into what they want da, 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 da. so i thought that friday was probably the best example of what i have to do going forward but it also made me question everything i did prior right the kind of slow approach i did because usually i'd start my night off playing like some african tunes some like weird shit whatever do you know what I mean and then kind of slowly progress into some classic disco songs or some R&B stuff and whatever and then slowly kind of close it out into some kind of like club classic and hits whatever like club hits right going out and I've kind of realized that maybe I should change it up man maybe I should do it the opposite like start off hot like the hot record sometimes in the beginning 
or just split them and then kind of do the rest of it after too. That might be a good idea. And I'm gonna te- I'm, again, I'm gonna test this approach out maybe at the at uh, at tap at tap east happening again on Friday, as I mentioned, 27th of July. Tapped east, tapped, 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 tapped. This should be on the screen now at the at the tap east in Westfield Stratford. So come and check that out. I'm gonna try that approach again and hopefully this will work. Uh, talking about club nights and talking about all all good stuff that involves going out. I've been meditating a lot or thinking a lot about the whole Hackney Council licensing stuff, right? That's been going, that's been kind of uh, grabbed everyone's attention on social media, especially if you follow people that tend to go out or people that are behind some of the best clubs in the land. And as I mentioned on Twitter the other day, I've kind of changed my mind with the whole idea. I was very much against it. I was very much uh, rah, 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 uh, burn down Hackney Council and how dare they and um no one wants this blah 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 but having looked at the evidence having really read some of the pieces of information that pertain to it i've kind of changed my mind on it hold on let me see if i can can i zoom in i can't zoom in oh annoying anyway i sort of changed my mind a little little bit and uh, most of it has to do with i don't know it's 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 a complicated affair right it's a complicated affair it's a complicated affair that no one really knows how to address but I thought the interesting thing behind it that really makes that really kind of like um, shows the kind of divide in opinions or divide on direction the way London should go comes from the 24 hour tube. Right. The 24 hour tube was Sadiq Khan's like um, it's like, you know, when Rudy Giuliani cleaned up the streets of New York, of New York like by taking away all the drugs and all the seediness and all the prostitution and shit. So he can't kind of use the 24 hour tube thing as his sort of like legacy, right? Of that he's going to leave behind as being London mayor. And, you know, like tourism in London hasn't been higher, is at its highest now. Uh, people are coming in from all different parts of the world. You're even seeing with the resurgence of places like Shoreditch and Old Street that are inviting tourists in as well. People are not just going to Leicester Square and Piccadilly Circus to come visit London. They're venturing out to other parts of East London. London hasn't been. It has, it, there's never been a better time to come visit London than there is now, right? And a 24-hour tube is just another extension of kind of like allowing London to kind of um, resemble some of our European counterparts and also allow people access to some of the best spots around London and also safe transport back home. Cool. But then there seems to be a real divide between Sadiq Khan's idea of what London should be like and the actual residents. Uh, of these council, of these boroughs who, who actually live there, right? Their day in, day out struggles because the 24 hour tube represents where London should be going. But then the Hackney Council licensing law um, that kind of got introduced recently, the curfew on uh, bars and clubs to close, is it 11? No, is it 11 on weekdays and 12 on weekends? That kind of represents like what the actual residents of those boroughs want it to be, right? There's, and, but there seems to be no middle ground at the moment which is a little bit concerning. And I guess if you're someone that's a fan of the 24-hour tube and you want to go out in Hackney, having a 24-hour tube and only being able to party up until 12 doesn't really make any sense. And then what... Um, da, 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 and what else I've read here? And then on the other side of it as well, because I remember I, re- I read this stat on this article that mentions that um, £66 billion pounds is generated by uh, the nighttime economy, right? London generates. That's what annually, right? And it accounts for six percent of uh, the UK's GDP, right? Gross domestic product. That's like the marker to judge um, how s- um, great the economy, how successful a particular city or nation is doing. So, sixty-six billion is generated from the nighttime economy per year. But then, I guess if you're living in these boroughs, your counter argument would be that the nighttime economy doesn't have to extend beyond 11 p.m anyway it should just stay uh, it, it, it should it can it can live within the hours of uh 5 to 11 p.m and i remember someone from the ca- council committee mentioning something about like it's not always about clubs isn't it like i think because the save oh, was that love love hackney initiative or those that kind of group that's kind of protesting this whole legislation they're very much in bed with, you know, the nightclub and bar owners who only represent a fraction of, you know, what it means to kind of live in these boroughs day in, day out, which I kind of understand. Um, and then, but then the only thing that kind of threw me off a little bit was I watched this video about what Amsterdam, how Amsterdam has kind of approached the whole nighttime economy thing, right? Um, and the government sort of realized or understood that, you know, as 
as probably annoying as reputation of you know Amsterdam being a seedy place with the red light district and the marijuana and the drug use and shit. As about as as bad as that may be, there is it's probably doing more good than bad for the overall GDP and the overall uh, um, well being and job security and all that malarkey for people that live in Amsterdam in general, right? So they kind of um, allow themselves, they kind of put down their own, they kind of put aside their own sort of um, prejudices, right? Their own points of view and appointed a nighttime mayor who was responsible for bringing in this initiative that kind of allowed 10 venues in Amsterdam to have a 24 hour license, right? So they chose 10 of the best venues and gave them a 24 hour license. And I'm pretty sure that 24 hour lunch uh, license came with the responsibility to ensure that their patrons inside and outside the bar are safe and well behaved, right? So it kind of puts the owners back on the clubs to kind of take ownership, right? Of um, how, how they treat their customers, right? And how they treat the space around them. Um, and it kind of reminds me of the image of the Japanese fans and Senegalese fans during the World Cup cleaning up their stands after the World Cup finished, right? So, like, um, picking up cups and shit, you know what I mean? Like, to help out the staff members that are working in the stadium, but just in general, just to kind of, you know, be good um, citizens for their nation or good representatives for their nation. And I think Amsterdam choosing those 10 clubs has kind of done the same sort of thing too, right? Because if you're on those 10 clubs, the last thing you want to do is lose your license. <coughs> due to you kind of not being proactive and not taking care of your uh, punters. And then outside of that, you have um, this initiative, which I also like, um, in the main city square, they've got these things called host, where they all wear red, they all wear red jackets, right? And they kind of act as in like the intermediaries uh, between the police and the kind of, I don't know, the police and the club owners, let's say, outside of the venues. And they're kind of similar to what we have here in London. We have these guys and girls called pastors that kind of wear these fake police uniforms sort of thing um we have other people could patrol people i see sometimes mostly in dawson and shoreditch i see them wandering around places but they you know they kind of look a little bit too security laden you know i think they've got stab proof or bulletproof vests on and shit but these uh the, the host in um in amsterdam just wear kind of coach jackets and shit which probably isn't safe maybe they've got a vest on underneath to kind of you know but they, from the, from the looks of it, they sort of look a little bit harmless. And But the idea behind it is that they're the ones that are kind of meant to warn you when you're getting a bit too leery. And I, I'd assume because, you know, ma mainly because of British tourists going over there and kind of causing absolute ruckus, you know, just to kind of like warn you, look, hey, we don't want to call the police, but if we have to, we will. And if they if we do call them, it's not going to end the same way that it's going to end with, with us talking to you now, which is understandable, right? Cool. Safe. Then the other... Um, and I, it kind of made me think about like why didn't just London why didn't London just copy that um, template right why didn't London just copy that template and sort of like allow I don't know let's say, let's say let's not even say ten let's say three to five of the best clubs in London to have a twenty four hour license right or a license that extended up until six a.m. right which would be fucking amazing. And then what that would have done is that it would have stopped this thing that happens in Dawson, happens in Shoreditch, happens in probably in, Hack in Hackney too, especially if you hang around at Hackney Wick, where because most of the clubs close out at the same time, you have this max, mass exodus happens around 1 to 2 a.m. where everyone's out in the streets causing a ruckus, trying to get an Uber, trying to find the next warehouse party, trying to pick up some scavengers so they can bang, whatever, I don't know, scoring drugs. Like all of the, like the whole entire world congregates on the street for about an hour to an hour and a half, right? And so everyone kind of disperses and goes their own, uh, their own separate ways. But I can imagine if you live in that kind of area, having that amount of noise occurring at one particular time must be super annoying, right? And it's going to get even worse when they bring it forward, right? Because people are not going to be as drunk as it would be at one or two. Because usually at one or two, people are already quite drunk anyway, especially if they've been out the whole entire day. And they usually just slip away home anyway after an hour and a half. But, you know, I'm, I'm assuming um, between the hours 11 and 12, people are going to be still quite active and shit. So having everyone out at the same time is probably not the best idea. And I guess the 24-hour license thing in Amsterdam works really well because as you might have noticed if you've been to places like Berlin, when you go to a club that's open 24 hours, it's really interesting to see the kind of changing flow into in the room overall. It kind of clears, it clears out, but never gets really, it never gets completely empty, but you can tell that space is open up and shit. Then it, it ramps up again. It, it kind of gets full again when a certain DJ comes on because people are coming to see someone play. Then it kind of slows out again. But 
what you notice when you go out is that you're never with a group of people. You're always with like one or two. You're never with hordes, sorry, never with hordes of people. You're with groups of people. Whereas when you come out in London, especially if you go out in Dawson, Shoreditch or Hackney, you're always, especially if you, if you, walk, if you come out the same time everyone else does, you're always within like a horde of people, like walking down the street. And that horde of people just, you know, there's never, never, there's never a good thing that comes out of hanging out or walking back home with a group of people. Like someone's always going to get a bit of Dutch courage and get a bit leery and do something silly, jump on a bus shelter, say something to someone standing at a bus stop. That's just nonsense happens during that certain time, right? And it's never, a, it's never really, a, it's never a good thing. I just don't, I don't think it's a good thing. So I think sometimes having the twenty-four hour um, ending time allows people to go out at you know it kind of drip these people out like stag stagnant it kind of staggers the kind of exit so you never get that kind of mass halls of people loitering around the streets so as great as as much as i can understand the hackney council the committee members or residents having their trepidations or having you know reservations behind giving clubs license to late licenses um being kind of like you know a bit more free with the late license giveaways it isn't going to end well when you have a whole horde of people just standing outside at 11 or 12 a.m or 12 p.m sorry and then um well oh and then basically that that um that question it got answered by this quote that i read in the art in the kind of um in the report that they writ up after the whole meeting took place and basically it says while drafting the policy, a cost-benefit analysis found Hackney's nightlife left the council 1.5 million out of pocket each year through social and economic costs like cleaning and, and borough level enforcement. It also found in more food-focused um, areas like Stoke Newington, there was a much less alcohol-related crime than Shoreditch. So, which is the main key takeaway here, right? Is that Hackney Council are basically saying that as great as the nighttime economy has been for London overall, it's costing certain boroughs a lot more in terms of cleanup and law enforcement. Um, it's costing them a lot more monthly. It's, co it's costing them a lot more um, to clean up the streets and to make sure people are safe and shit. <clears throat> so they've always been left in a deficit. And they've realised that if they take more of a Stoke Newton approach in things, right, where there's not, I, I'm assuming apart from, what is, it, is it called the Free Compasses or something or the Corner Roundabout? I don't know. There's another pub as well. They're not really. There's no places open super late. Bar or bar is a club that's not really. That's open late sometimes, but for the most part, bars and clubs in Stoke Newton close behind around the hours of like one or two a.m. or something a bit a bit earlier, and it's and it usually attracts a more older, mature clientele, right? So, basically, what the, what basically Acne Council is saying is that they want to position hackney to look more like or to <clears throat> or to look to copy more of the stoke newton point of view as opposed to the dawson shoreditch point of view which is understandable because if you've been to shoreditch on a friday or saturday night you know it's an absolute hellhole right um i, I think even us uh nighttime fish enthusiasts such as myself we can kind of confess that shoreditch is probably represents what can go what can go wrong when you kind of like um adopt this idea that the nighttime economy has only got its benefits and never hasn't got any negatives you know, um, the cleanup crew do an amazing job. Um, the cleaners and whatever do an amazing job to kind of make that place look uh, spick and span in the morning. But if you've been there between the hours of like 11 and 3, 3 a.m., you're just like, fucking hell, it's like World War Z. Do you know what I mean? Zombies everywhere. People absolutely smashed to the gills, which obviously isn't the fault of the bars or the whatever. It's, kind of, it's, kind of, it's something that kind of goes from the top, you know, this enforcement of making sure bars close at a certain time so that they're, you know, they're forced to run these drink promotions that get people hammered for cheap and then they get chucked out of one bar at 11 and then they only have three hours left to rave and they go to another bar and that bar needs to make more money so they let them in even though they absolutely smash and sh probably shouldn't be drinking more and then it's just a complete fuck up, right? Everyone's kind of fucking up. Everyone's kind of contributing to this whole like um, circle jerk of absolute diabolic behavior but I can understand the reservations that Hackney Council has that they don't want to follow suit and kind of follow the example of Shoreditch and kind of want to go more towards the idea of Stoke Newington. But the only problem is that Stoke Newington, by its very nature, does attract a more a, a more mature, quieter crowd. And plus it's near schools and shit. But for the most part, Hackney Council, Hackney in general, there's it's, it's, it's mainly a millennial borough. There's, there's a lot of young people in the area, loads and loads of young people. It's going to take a long while to kind of drive them out of that area. And unfortunately... If you've been, if you've lived in Hackney or you've been around Hackney marshes, you'll know that um, the whole illegal warehouse party thing and field raises has, has ramped up 
um, up to an obscene level, um, especially this summer when the weather's been amazing. Like, there's the, I don't think there's been a year where I've, where I've seen that many forest raves happen week in, week out. Um, and, they're, and they're bloody incredible. They're organized really well. They're put, they're put on by amazing promoters who kind of get really cool DJs to come along and we party and have a good time. It's fucking great. But, they're illegal warehouse parties and they're illegal field rape parties. They don't have any security. There's no, there's no real safety for the people that are there. They're in the lapidate areas of the borough. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just everyone. No one wins when you push people out of nightclubs and bars and then you, uh, you tell them to kind of, you know, you kind of force them to put on these illegal warehouse parties or raves in order to kind of continue partying. And it really is a bad state of affairs because, you know, if you've been to places such as Berlin, which I keep mentioning again and again and again, but in Berlin. Some of the biggest clubs in that city are kind of backed by the government, are tax exempt. Some, some, even places like Bergheim, for example. So they have a way, they have a kind of rule where they kind of enforce their own kind of drug policy inside the club, right? So they have their own kind of dealers who they kind of vet and make sure they deal kind of safe drugs and whatever. It's kind of, it's not said, but it's sort of something that a lot of clubs do. And they kind of police their own. But then if you go in there and some idiot tries to sell some drugs in there, they'll kind of get you arrested and get you chucked out instantly, right? But they have their own kind of connections that make sure that place is safe so that you don't have any episodes or any uh, anything has happened as, you know, you don't have back-to-back -back deaths that Fabric had in their, in their regard, right? Fabric had fucking, you know, like sniffer dogs and metal detectors and like a million security guards walking in and out of the venue. Do you know what I mean? And they still have people dying in there, which, you know, is more of a sad and more of a bad indictment on the club as opposed to the dealers themselves, right? And also in general, like I mentioned in my other podcast, I just think overall, I think London and the UK in general has a real big problem with nightlife and drug culture in general. There's a real taboo behind it, which is the reason why we don't have this balance when it comes to these licensing laws. Because as a committee member, I think they just got too much power. You know, like having put in the licensing um, approval um, it entirely in the hands or in the lap of the committee members gives them way too much power. And as you and as you might have known, as you might have experience yourself having dealt with anyone in the council um or anyone that's anyone in the council in general going into the council building to do with anything to do with uh, council tax whatever you know how much of a ball ache or how much or how some sometimes the the rude characters you interact when you go into that building because they hold some level of power over you do you know what i mean they have this job that's you know fairly um um that's fairly, you know, run of the mill. But once you need something off of them, they kind of get a little bit power hungry, which is, again, it's not, it's not kind of a, it's not a slight on the person at all. It's just a part of human nature. Do you know I mean, if you give someone power, you give them the kind of rule of law to, to, you know, to approve or disapprove of a night or of a party, whatever, they kind of going to get a little bit power mad. And I don't think that's a good thing either. And also I don't think it's a good thing to kind of like, you know, approve it everyone's license or give everyone a 25 license because some clubs are not responsible and some clubs don't take care of their patrons so there needs to be a balance but now it just seems that there is no balance at all and it seems like areas such as hackney which is thriving and the whole creative scene and the whole kind of nightlife culture and restaurant culture and art galleries and all that sort of malarkey is kind of the part of the fabric and the dna of that area or of that of that borough has now kind of been you know they're just putting it to one side and saying you know what we're going to concentrate on just an older market who are you know fair enough the older market they want to concentrate on they want to make it more food focused and more probably family friendly but those people are going to get older after a while and then you know they're, they're not going to they're not going to be they won't have they won't they won't be as um eager to spend the disposable income within that borough to keep the economy floating do you know what I mean so it's not a real it's not a great long-term strategy to kind of focus only on the older demographic um of your borough in general but again, I don't know what the answer is. I don't. Obviously, of course, the answer isn't you know abusing that um, Amy Lammy woman, uh, the night czar, who obviously people have now seen her limitations of her power, and she's also probably now seen the limitations of her own role, um, which has been quite funny to see. You know, she tweeted out the other day that it wasn't her responsibility to kind of get involved in something that has to be taken up with the borough and kind of you know snarkily put a link to some PDF um, backing up her point. And then after a backlash of uh, scores of backlash, she then tweets out again that oh, she's going to be calling for an urgent meeting with somebody. It's just like, Pfft. I don't get how someone from New Jersey is the bloody um, uh, nightmare in you have London. I don't think she goes out that much in general. I don't know. She doesn't look at someone that goes out or parties a lot or knows what's happening on the ground level of Hackney or ground level of London overall. Um, it's really strange that 
she's somebody that was part of the Labour Party in general. And I remember seeing the job for Knights are being advertised, right? But somehow she's the person that got that got hired. You know, I'm sure other people apply for the role, but she's the one that got hired anyway. It's just very, very strange. But again, the answer isn't abusing her because I don't think it's, it's something. To, it's not not. It's something that's way above her pay grade anyway. Regardless, it's something that has to be looked at um in terms of you know who you vote for in your local elections and i'm sure those i'm sure those committee members were voted in just this may got this may that's just passed right in the local election so that we probably have to look at our, we only have to look at ourselves in terms of how we probably fucked up and, and dropped the ball in terms of uh, not voting in members of the committee that would kind of like you know um help us with our own agenda but we are where we are at the moment i'm not sure what the answer is but bloody hell man what a strange time to live in hackney right when well, you're gonna be living in a place where bars and clubs are going to close at 11 and 12 on the weekend it's just like fucking hell how boring can you get what can you do um what else is next on the docket neymar on diving this is a good actual article which i thought was very interesting my man neymar neymar's had an interesting um year or so hasn't he um since he moved to psg um, it seems like everyone's everyone can't wait until he flops. He moved, he left Barcelona in order to kind of seek more glory at PSG, and it seemed like he was seeking individual glory, which is a bit unfair for people to say that because you know footballers have a short career, um, and if you're playing, if you're if you're if you're playing in a team that consists of a Messi, and you're still playing in a you're still in a modern era of football where Cristiano Ronaldo it still exists. There's, there's, a, there's you only have a slim opportunity in order to kind of like you know win glory or win uh domestic glory or personal glory right because there's, there's these two freaks of nature that are currently occupying the, the space above you so if he took it upon himself to kind of move somewhere else where he'd kind of get more of the shine and he'd kind of be a bit more the vocal point i think he's within his right to do that but of course the psg experiment didn't work in europe it kind of worked in league oh, of course because you know they always run away with the league in there for the most part and then he went to Brazil with the World Cup and it kind of didn't work out there either. And, he, you know, his kind of theatrics of rolling around on the floor were really, really exposed. And it kind of made him seem like, you know, someone that enjoys the whole theatrical side of football. And he spoke about it a little bit um, on this article on Sky Sports News, which I thought was quite interesting that I want to read out quickly to you guys. Now, so it reads, uh, Neymar defends his diving for Brazil at the World Cup. Zoom in a little bit here. Uh, Brazil and PSG forward Neymar has hit back at critics of his ant theatrics at the World Cup saying they will never understand. Criticism of Neymar was widespread leading to memes of the player do dominating social media sites. I'm pretty sure you guys have seen it of him rolling around everywhere. And there was a club I think in Brazil that did this competition where I think you won a free ticket or a season ticket or something like that where you start rolling from the halfway line all the way to the goal and the first person to roll to the gets to the goal wins. <laughs> uh, Neymar has taken a mockery in his stride but made it clear the treatment he receives is not a laughing matter. Uh, do you think I want to suffer tackles all the time? No, it's painful and it hurts. After games, I stay back for four or five hours putting on ice. It's complicated, but if you have, haven't experienced that, you will never understand. I saw the jokes, but I took it with humour. Even yesterday, I posted on Instagram a joke with the children about it. But my football is to dribble, to face the opponent. I can't stand in front of the opponent and say, my dear, excuse me, I want to score a goal. I can't do that. I have to dribble past him. I have to try to do something and he will not allow me to go past. And he will try to foul me. A lot of time, I'm faster and lighter than other players. They tackle me and the referee is there for that. Um, Neymar is also widely linked to the, the, the. So, interesting that he said that, right? They will never understand when I kind of... I kind of I kind of agree with him, right? Because I've always I've kind of always um I've always said and it's always really pissed me off that sometimes referees won't give a penalty to a player when he stays on his feet and kind of tries to stay up in the box, right? Happened a couple of times. I think it happened a couple of times. It used to happen a lot with Welbeck. It used to kind of annoy me when he was at, at United, right? He never used to go down at contact in the box. He'd always try and like, you know, battle his way through and then kind of scuff his shot and it would go wide, right? But the referee would never give a foul. And if you took that outside the box, right, if a player was trying to uh, play someone through or, or play out wide, right, and they got tackled uh, just as they was playing it and the ball went out of, out of touch, the referee would bring it back and kind of give a free kick from there. Even though the pass was deployed and it went towards a player, you know, the, the player didn't have the capability to pass um, without interruption because the, he got fouled, right? But if you try to stay on your feet in the box or you're trying to hurdle a player that does a crazy tackle, the referee isn't going to give you a penalty. Or sometimes if you're outside the box and you don't 
make it, you don't make the player, the don't make referee aware that you got fouled, you won't get fouled either. And sometimes the f- I, I get the feeling that Neymar, his free tricks, even though they're a bit overboard, overblown sometimes, I feel like if you look at the tackles that he gets, um, with the exception of a few that when, you know, he does a few dives, I think he did one against Croatia where he kind of kicked out a player and tried to flick four on the floor. But with the exception of those two or three examples where he kind of actually is faking and he's falling on the floor, he does get clattered a lot. If you go back and look at his days during Santos, man, he used to get absolutely battered, battered, battered. And to, considering how light and how um, uh, svelte and slim he is, he doesn't get injured that often. Considering the level of abuse he gets on the pitch, he gets kicked on the thigh, on the knee, behind the calf, on the ankle, stepped on his toe. He does get absolutely clattered all over, all over the pitch. Because, you know, as you mentioned, he is a lot quicker. He is a lot lighter. He's got that low center of gravity. We can kind of, you know, he does that messy thing where he can kind of like duck underneath your, your elbow and kind of like go around you and stuff. So I get that. And like I said before, I, it's just annoying that referees don't give fouls unless players make a meal of it they just don't like they don't pull things back a little bit they don't like that's why people when that's why when people are getting pulled in a box you rarely see someone getting a penalty when they're getting pulled in the box if they just continue if they don't make a meal of it you kind of have to do the whole like pull your hands in the air like oh ref look look i'm getting pulled you know i mean and even then you still don't get the, the bloody free kick or you still don't get the penalty which is super super annoying so i think until referees can give until referees can give fouls or give away free kicks are penalties to players when they're actually getting tackled, even if they don't f- fall on the floor, we're never going to stop diving. Or the other option is to do what um, most English pundits say, you know, the kind of like, quote unquote, stereotypical English media cliche of like, oh, they should just book them if they dive on the floor, book them, book them. But you can't essentially do that because in real time, it's really hard to spot a dive in real time. It's easy to spot it um, after uh, after the fact of watching it on TV, but in real time with the ball moving around and the referee uh, swiveling his head left and right, it's hard to see what's a fat, what's a dive and what's not a dive. And it's all subjective as well. So kind of interpret that this player is trying to cheat the systems per se. I just think referees need to take more responsibility and give the bloody foul, even if the player doesn't fall on the floor, just give it. And then that'll stop everything in general. But um, it's good to see Neymar acknowledge it and kind of, you know, take the jokes in his stride. They were really funny. I think the memes all over the place were extremely laughable. But it also goes to show that he's not the most likable player, is even though he's very entertaining. Um, he's someone that I enjoy watching a lot. He's someone that, like, you know, just seeing him run. It's like um, I prefer to see Gino pushed than, than you know, I prefer to, I, I, I would watch hours and hours of just Gino in, in, in Iwachi just, like, pushing a skateboard down the street, right? Or just oiling up and down curbs. And Neymar's the same. I just love to see him running on the ball. Forget the skills and the dribbles and the lollipops and the flicks over the head and shit. Just him running with the ball. He's so graceful, man. It's fucking amazing. Just seeing the way he accelerates, uh, he changes the pace, the way he slows the ball down. Like, fucking insane. Um, but it seems like he's not very well liked, you know, in term, in general by um, football pundits and, you know, and watchers of the game and other players too when he kind of falls on the floor and does his whole roly-poly stuff. But like I say, if you watch, if you see a... Look at his theatrics at the World Cup for the for the bar two or three exceptions he did he did get clattered a lot so I kind of do see where he's um distaste his disdain for people that kind of like you know laugh at him kind of comes from and I guess if you don't play the game and you're not um, that built like him you will never really understand to be honest for the most part um what else oh um DJ advice from Young Marco I thought this was quite interesting to um kind of speak about quickly. Um, young Marco, one of the my favorite DJs and someone I've kind of looked up to for a while. I saw him play back to back with Motor City Drum Ensemble at XOYO a few months ago, which was fucking incredible. XOYO as well, such a great venue. Um, much better than Phonox in my opinion for those big kind of um nightclub-y places. I think XOYO is probably my my favorite to go to. Um, really friendly bouncers, really easy to get in. Um, great bar service. They've got two rooms. Um. Just great access to toilets. The coke room is great. Like, just, I don't know. I just love XOY. I think it's fucking awesome. Plus, it's in an area where I can kind of get back home quite easily, kind of in between Shoreditch and an Old Street kind of area. Fucking love it. Anyway, Young Marco says something very interesting, which I'm kind of still trying to struggle. I'm still struggling with mentally um, in terms of how to play a set when you're DJ. And it kind of lends itself to what I was saying in the beginning of, my, of the podcast about coming into a, a DJ set and kind of starting hard, right? And he kind of says the following, and I'm going to kind of speak a little bit about it now. Hope I can get up on the screen and this works. 
Click here. Click show. If this works here, and you guys can see this. Let's go. If you're starting out as an artist, you have a lot of insecurities. You can only overcome by failing. You have to fail, you know. You have to clear dance floors to know how to fill dance floors. And you have to make awful tracks to make good tracks. Sometimes you have a room full of people and half of them will never enjoy the music you're playing. So if you put on the right song to piss them off and make them leave, then you're left with the other half, which will have a great time. And that's making a right mistake. I've made that mistake a couple of times and I found out it works. And those are the little all the tricks of the trade you can learn as a DJ. It's a very fine skill, clearing half a dance floor. <laughs> now, yeah, interesting, right? Clearing dance floors. I, I like what it says that you have to know, you have to know how to like, you have to know how to clear a dance floor in order to know how to fill a dance floor, right? You have to know how to, you have to know how to make a shitty track in order to, to make a good track, right? So, something that I've kind of like uh, struggled with a lot recently is that Sometimes I feel like when I DJ, I'm kind of playing to the crowd too much, right? Uh, because I've had this, well, it kind of, again, maybe I'm talking to myself about this. I'm kind of rationalizing my own opinion, but I guess it kind of makes more sense because I usually play in bars and clubs that are usually um, uh, frequented by an older clientele or by people that don't necessarily want to hear the latest um, DJ Cos track, right? So it's a kind of like, you know, a, a bar or club. Just people just want to have a good time, listen to some music and just, you know, and go home, right? But they don't want to, they don't want to get like a resident advisor set. And I've usually, and I've had the experience of going to bars and clubs like this, right? Where you go in there and the DJ is playing like a fuck, he's playing a super self-indulgent set that not everyone's going to like, right? And just, you know, there's no, and the, the whole bar is full of people that are just, you know, that not necessarily people that you necessarily see in a nightclub or something. Just people just want to go out, have a good time. So I kind of used to wrap me up the wrong way. It's like, how fucking, um self-indulgent and self-centered can you be to play a four-hour set of just your stuff stuff that you like right playing nothing that a crowd would be into at all and i kind of always um let lend myself again lending myself to the whole like berlin and I, idea of djing where i'm kind of gonna give you some a bit of what you want and a bit of what i want a bit of what you want a bit of what i want and then it gets to a point where you're gonna trust me so much that i'm gonna be able to play what i want and you're gonna like it right it's that kind of like give and take that's the kind of like um I did. I like it just because at the level I am now, I can't do that. I don't have the I don't have the the luxury or the permission to play anything that I want because usually to play anything that you want means you're gonna play in front of a bigger audience, right? Who are kind of used to you playing anything that you want, and you can kind of take a few more chances in that respect. But I can't necessarily do that yet, so I haven't got the permission to do that at the moment, right? Um, in terms of my um, how long I've been doing it and the place I've been doing it, blah, 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 blah. But there is something to be said, right? Because I remember I did this a few mo a few weeks ago, right? I remember playing in at the Heathcote and Star and it wasn't, it wasn't that full at all, pretty empty. But there was a couple of girls there that kept coming up to me asking me to play R&B, play this, play this, play that. So I was like, no, I'm going to play what I want to play. You don't tell me what to play, right? So I, I purposely started playing <laughs> really obscure disco, slow disco tracks to the point that I could hear her. And I, I, and I always do this thing where, Again, I'm, I, I recommend anyone who DJs and you play in small bars and clubs that are not necessarily that full to don't put the, the sound super high. Put it at reasonable levels so people can hear each other. Again, if you go to... I've mentioned Berlin so many times, podcasts is fucking getting annoying, but whatever. If you go to a place like Berlin, you'll notice that most bars and clubs have the volume set perfectly so that I don't need to shout when I'm talking to you in a bar, right? I can just talk to you normally. Whereas if you go to most bars and clubs in London, the volume is always that fucking red. It's always red line. If you, if you, if, if you had permission to go behind the decks and look at the... Uh, the level meters you'd see that everything's always yellow and red right it's never in the greens so i'm always recommending people to always put their volume at uh red so at green make sure it's a certain level and if it's not full just put a song sound really really low so people can kind of you know in terms of have to shout at each other when they're in a the bar so I'm, i remember i was playing these songs that she the, the group of people hated i can and I, I was playing it i was playing the, the volume so at a particular level so low that i could hear what she was saying at the bar she was getting really pissed off and then i played one more song and she just walked out i was like yes fuck you do you know what i mean i'm not I'm not i'm not here at the behest of you 
right? I'm not going to play what you want at the moment that you want it. I'm going to play it later, but don't force me to play it right now. Do you know what I mean? Especially not, especially when it's completely empty. Relax, isn't it? Chill out, man. Have a drink. Relax. But there is, there was something very gratifying about doing that, right? And then the people seeing that I did it on purpose and then playing my own stuff. And then they were like, you know what? I respect that guy. And, and then I played what they wanted later anyway, but I wasn't going to play it when they wanted it. But again, there's this really, there's a real conflict behind it between, again, if I'm playing at the beginning and there's people coming um, in from the beer garden and they kind of hear me playing really obscure shit to clear the dance floor, I'm not going to keep punters in. That's, the bar's not going to make that much money and it's just gonna, not going to be a good night. Um, so there's a balance there that I kind of need to make, but I also need to kind of make a concentrated effort of not playing to the crowd all the time, of not having it just be about them. Sometimes it can be about me. I kind of get, I am allowed to be a bit selfish sometimes in that respect. So that's sometimes something that I'm kind of trying to work towards at the moment. Um, again, it's, it's something that requires a lot of self-confidence, something that requires um, a little bit of balls in that regard, right? You can't, you can't be afraid of making, mis- you can't be afraid of making mistakes. And again, maybe in my infancy at the moment, maybe it's something I've kind of need to get over. But yeah, um, some very uh, wise words from young, young, young Marco. And I definitely recommend you check it out. It's a video series called Selectors. There's a really good one that I watched actually recently with a female DJ. What's her name? Is it Helena Huff? Is it Helena Huff? But anyway, I'll definitely recommend you check it out. I'll link it in the show notes. It's fucking awesome. Let me actually check it out and see if I can find it, actually. There's another one with the selectors on it that I thought was really, really good. But it's a great little series profiling some of the best DJs in the land. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, Lena, Wil- L- Lena Wilkinson. Really, really fucking good. Um, she's like one of the resident DJs at uh, Salon de Amateurs in Hamburg, um, which I another club that I kind of want to go to very, very soon. And I recommend you definitely, I definitely recommend you check that out because that series is fucking banging. We're already an hour in, aren't we? Should we do one more? Or should we leave it there? Um, let's do one more. Um, why Will Smith is great. So I saw this I saw this video too. Will Smith did recently did an interview with Rap Raider. Um, the annoying Elliot Will... What's his name? Elliot something. The guy that has that giggle laughing or whatever. They're a bit annoying. Um, but the interviews are usually quite good because they do a lot of research behind it, which is, you know, not very... Um, it's not a normal thing within the hip hop community. It seems everyone just kind of does like you know the fly by the seat of their pants or the kind of contra- controversy led interviews. But they are really focused on the music, and you can kind of you can see the appreciation of people's eyes when they kind of have to you know they kind of sit there have to talk about the music only overall. And Will Smith recently sat down having an interview with them. Will Smith's at an interesting stage of his career now, isn't he? Like he sort of reintroduced, reintroduced himself to the populace again via social media. He had the movie that he did on Netflix, and he's kind of positioning himself as maybe a Netflix blockbuster star maybe i don't know what the next evolution is going to be but it's interesting to see him turn himself into like a youtube vlogger and posting kind of a lot on instagram and shit doing the kiki challenge but it's great to see i just love listening to him because you know to sustain that level of career to be that much influential over that period of time over this long period of time uh, he's kind of hit the hit the ground running in everything he's sort of done, and I kind of love his mindset and perspective on things. And this part really kind of um, may reemphasize why Will Smith is great, and you, hopefully you can kind of get the gist of why he is where the way he is. Hope this comes up now. Show. Sure. Like what you said, you know, you had a great relationship with your father. You know, I know he mm-hmm. passed away like a year and a half year ago, and a half, but yeah. you know that scene. Has taken on a life of its own on the internet, you know, with you and Ben Vereen and yeah. why he don't want me no more. Yeah. It makes everybody cry. Like, what was the source of inspiration for that particular scene? Yeah, you know, it's funny, like that, the behind the scenes of that, um, James Avery was uh, relentlessly on me to elevate. Like, James Avery wouldn't give me a damn inch. Like everything I said, everything I did for James Avery was like, nope, not good enough. You know, he was like, if you you have this position, look where you are, look what you are blessed with. He was like, I'm sorry, but I'm not accepting anything other than absolute uh, committed perfection from you. And at that time, I was balling, you know. So I was, uh, you know. <laughs> and James Avery wouldn't give me nothing. And it's like he was—he was the model for me of an actor. 
you know. So but the craft, it's like James Avery was no bullshit. Like he was and, and that kind of really explains, in my opinion, why Will Smith is so great. He's had these mentors in his life from his father that I think he mentioned in an interview once uh, about how how he made his, him and his brother build, uh, the, rebuild the wall of their house brick by brick. Um, and it was kind of an authoritarian, former, uh, a former soldier. So he kind of had that background. And he obviously did inner drive and inner fire. And obviously working with James Embry, who's um, Uncle Phil in, in the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. He's had these mentors in his life that have recognized his talent, but, have also, but, have all, but are also aware that talent can only get you so far. And I remember there's a special, there's actually a video that Will Smith speaks about where he says, you may be more talented than me, right? But I'm willing to die on a treadmill. Are you willing to die? Like that's how far he's willing to go. So he, he's been installed with his work ethic, right? That's so, that's probably, his work ethic is probably at a higher level than what his talent maybe is. And even though his talent is really, really high, right? Obviously he's a very talented guy, but it kind of reaffirmed to me the idea of, of how important work ethic was, right? How important it was to call yourself up, to kind of like call yourself, call your, call your bluff, to kind of not give yourself an excuse, to not give yourself a reason to kind of say, you know what, that's enough, that's good enough to kind of put your all, your fucking all into everything, to kind of put your blood, sweat and tears into everything that you do in order to kind of reach the next level. And, you know, Will Smith is maybe the most obvious example of it, but I think there's a lesson to be gleaned from that, you know, like of like, you know, if you got, if you get given an opportunity um, that not a lot of people get given, especially, you know, Will Smith during the 80s to be, you know, a lead in a sitcom, you know, that's centered around his life, being a hip hop star. It's not like now, you know, if someone got a, a Fresh Prince style like TV series now where hip hop being the most dominant music genre in the world, it wouldn't be that much of a surprise. But imagine during the 80s, someone like Will Smith, who was, you know, he would say to himself before, like he wasn't regarded, he didn't have the coolest image in hip hop at the time being given such a cool show and being given the opportunity to kind of um, tell that hip hop story on the big screen, um, you know, prime time, Monday, Monday nights at 8 p.m. You know, James Every was on his back because, you know, this was a this was opportunity that he couldn't let go. He couldn't fuck up because this was this is going to dictate um, decades and decades of what would happen to come. And, you know, what what's to come? And, you know, you can say Will Smith and Fresh Prince was irresponsible for where hip hop is, you know, played a part in allowing it to kind of enter the public consciousness and that that episode where um his stepdad kind of no his road his biological dad kind of stands up and doesn't you know take him out or doesn't come and pick him up during that time and he cries into uncle phil's arms you know why doesn't he want me man that was a kind of you know uh that is one of the most influential episodes ever do you know what i mean that still lives on now and i think they mentioned even there's still memes about it now that people post on instagram all the time on Twitter as well, like little clips of it. So that really explains that. I kind of watched the whole interview and I thought, fuck, man. Will Smith's a fucking beast. Absolute amazing work ethic. Great perspective on things. Super self-aware. Very insightful. And you can kind of see the fruits of his uh, approach with his children right? and how well-adjusted they are considering the amounts, the insane level of fame and wealth they have to their um, available at their disposal. They're fairly, 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 fairly centered. You know what I mean? Fairly normal kids are just going out there and kind of achieve, trying to actualize their dreams and inspire a whole generation through their actions not just through just mindless in inspiration that's another thing as well that kind of annoys me you know those inspirational guys are just like ah my whole life is just about inspiring i just want to inspire people inspire 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 right don't tell me you're inspiring people man just work hard do great work do you know what i mean lead by example and those kids are doing that you know they play instruments they uh, uh jaden smith just put out uh electric uh, the, the what the, the in indie kind of version of his uh, his album called siri or siri or siri or siri however you pronounce it uh willow smith plays at festivals all over, all over the world and she's currently doing that red table confessional thing with her mum. like amazing kids man super well adjusted and who lead by example and it all comes from the top down you know they've got great parents in jada and will smith and i don't know i just love the i love the interview i thought it's a really insightful a really rare opportunity to kind of get an insight into where he is because for the most part he hasn't really been doing that many interviews he's kind of mostly leaving the con mostly pushing most of his content on his social media feed so i recommend you check it out i'll link it as getting the show notes if you're not um watching this via youtube and you can check it out yourself anyway that's about an hour of the excellent english show probably enough time of me blabbering Thank you so much for tuning in to episode number 85 of the Axel Zinger Show. As ever, as ever, to find out more information about moi, 
and to kind of you know keep abreast of all my current movings and in and outs and all that malarkey um there's a link below on the show notes to my website xnozinga.com you can find my blog you can find my podcast you can find my youtube channel if you want to subscribe to there you can subscribe to that too check out my vlog on there and all my other podcast episodes i put on there clips and shit i'll put on there as well um you can find my dj mixes you can find out where i'm gonna play where i'm gonna dj next you can there's a contact form there every little piece of information that you need to contact your boy or to gain more insight into what i'm doing outside of the podcast you can glean it from agnosinger.com and obviously and also if you feel like this podcast is bringing you some level of entertainment and you feel like buying me a beer why not support me on patreon that link is also going to be attached on the show notes you can find that um click that in the show notes in your podcast so you can find that below if you're watching the youtube video buy me a beer donate some money I'm going to spend that on beers and buying new and buying better and new equipment, maybe a new camera, maybe a new uh, rent out a studio. If that patron bubble or little nut gets a little bit bigger than what it is before. And yeah, I'm playing um, next when Oh, on Friday at the Heath, at the sorry at the Tap East for a night called Tapped. So I'm playing at Tap East this Friday. I'm going to get up on the screen now. You guys can see it's on the screen. So Tapped this Friday. Um, from 5 to 11.30 alongside my friend Aphrodite. So if you're in the area, come on down. Let's have a boogie or two. It should be a fun occasion. This has been the Agus Nozinga Show, episode number 85. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. I've had so much fun. I hope you have some fun too. And I'll see you guys again on Wednesday. Thanks for tuning in. Peace!